Um, so let me first ask um, what um, you'd like me to review or where do you'd like me to start since I don't think you've been listening to the first two lectures, although maybe you maybe you saw them on um, YouTube. They're both posted on YouTube. So um, Okay, so so let me, so we have two new students today. Um, the, I'd like to know what you'd like me to talk about. Um, I've I've already done lectures on basic group theory and representations of groups, and the next thing that I started last time was Lie algebras, but. Um, I'm not sure what you'd like me to do. Um, it, would you like me just to start with um, with the Lie algebras and just do a very quick review of the first two lectures from last week, or or what? So you could, you know, speak up, send a chat message. Uh, um, let me you you can certainly unmute if you want to uh, that's the only way to talk is uh, make yourself heard is you have to unmute um, or you can send me a chat message let's see if i have the chat oh there's chat sorry i didn't have chat illuminated all right well let me let me let me do the uh, what we, what I think would be best for both of you. Let me start with um, what a group is. And in fact, um, uh, this chapter is on the class website. It's also in my book, of course, but um, a PDF is on the class website. It's chapter 11 on group theory. So um, instead of saying abstractly what a group is, um, let me first, well, maybe I will say what it is. It's a set of elements and an operation. The operation is conventionally called multiplication, but um, it's sometimes a little bit different from that. Um, the key, there are four key properties. The product of any two elements in the group is another element in the group. And then you can put the parentheses any way you want if you multiply three group elements together, you always get the same thing. Um, there's an identity element such that um, the identity times any group element from the left or the right is that same group element. And every element in the group has an inverse. So G, G inverse, so G, G inverse is G inverse, G is E. So these are the properties of a group. And um, the reason why it's useful in physics courses to talk about such things is um, that the set of physical transform, of all physical transformations that lead uh, on some set of objects that leave some property of the objects invariant naturally forms a group. So in other words, um, uh, and the reason for that is um, that, first of all, one transformation on a set of objects is to do nothing. And, in that, and that's the identity transformation. And um, in, uh, in that case, uh, obviously that's an, uh, a transformation that leaves everything invariant, including whatever the special property is. Um, moreover, if you do something, if you make a transformation that preserves the special property, you can um, invert the transformation 
And so every transformation has an inverse. Um, if you do physical transformations on objects, they're naturally associative. And, okay, here's a question here. Right, the identity uh, transformation doesn't change the group element. In other words, the identity element is E, E, e times G and G times E is just G. So the, the identity transformation is the do nothing transformation. Um, let me just raise this bar, this table slightly. Um, and then finally, if, if there are two transformations on a set of objects that leaves some property invariant and you do one and then the other, the property is still invariant. And so the product of two transformations is a transformation that um, leaves uh, the property of the objects uh, invariant. So that's why, that's what a group is and that's why they're relevant in physics. Um, the set of transformations, um, there are all sorts of examples. Um, coordinate transformations such as rotations or reflections leave the distance of any point in three or n dimensional space, the distance of each point from the origin um, invariant. And um, so that's, uh, oh gosh, somehow I've timed out the, so what I, in other words, if you have a bunch of points, um, uh, then, uh, and you, you just rotate them. Um, so these are a bunch of points and you rotate all of the points about the origin um, such that the distance of each point from the origin is invariant, then um, those are the rotations or you or the reflections. If you reflect this point over to here, it might be the same distance. It could be the same distance from the origin. So that's an example. Another example is linear transformations in n-dimensional space. You displace every vector by A. What that leaves invariant is the difference, the difference between any two points. So if you add A to X and add A to Y, the difference X minus Y is invariant. Notice here that um, the, the transformation is um, uh, just uh, addition, addition of vectors. Um, another set of transformations that's very important in relativity is um, the set of transformations that leave the um, distance of a point, spatial distance of a point from the origin minus the, tem the temporal dist distance. In other words, uh, they leave here, I've just lost my, um, so in other words, they leave R, squ uh, R squared minus C squared, T squared invariant. And um, what, wh what makes more sense is to, is to define it this way, that, that, um, that these leave X minus Y squared minus C squared, um, uh, Tx squared minus Ty squared uh, invariant. These are um, these are actually not simply the Lorentz transformations, but they're also the translations because because of the difference, you can just add any four vector to x or x and y, and then it cancels in this expression. Um, an important thing is the commutator which comes up in quantum mechanics a lot. This is the product in one order minus the product in the other order. Some groups are such that all of the commutators are zero. Those are called the, um, those are called abelian transformations named after Niels Abel who lived for only 27 years. Um, 19th century could have been could be brutal back there in Norway. 
Um, so matrices naturally form groups and um, matrix multiplication is a natural way to form groups. So the orthogonal groups, for example, are all the, uh, all the real n by n matrices. O n is the set of all n by n matrices that leaves the squared distance x1 squared plus x2 squared plus dot 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 plus xn squared. Oh, what does it mean if a commutator isn't zero? Well, it means that these are two different things that in, 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 in quantum mechanics interfere with each other and can't be simultaneously measured. So for example, in quantum mechanics, you have XP is I H bar, and uh, this leads to the uncertainty principle, which is that um, the, uh, I don't know what you call it, but the, the error in, in measuring position times the error in measuring momentum, that's a P here, it looks kind of funny. Let me see if I can fix that. All right, now it looks more like a P. Um, is greater than or equal to, I think it's um, H bar squared over four. Um, and I hope I have that right. Anyway, um, and the physical idea here is that to measure where something is, you need to know where your measurement apparatus is. So the measurement apparatus has to be screwed to the floor of the lab. On the other hand, to measure the momentum, you um, need to let the uh, the object that you're, whose momentum you're measuring bang into something very light and um, see how that light thing recoils. And so you want some, to measure momentum, you want something light and to measure position, you want something heavy. So there's an intrinsic incompatibility. Um, yeah, that description, by the way, I heard from uh, Robert Oppenheimer. Um, it was, um, I was very young at the time and he was, I guess my age at the time and um, well, my age now at the time and uh, he gave such a lecture at Brookhaven. Anyway, um, the set of um, unitary groups, well, uh, UN is a set of all N by N unitary matrices that, um, and, and well, automatically they, they leave this, uh, this quantity invariant um, uh, because that quantity is something like um, uh, Z, star dotted into Z and um, under a unitary transformation, Z will turn into UZ and Z star will turn into, sorry, I screwed up. Um, will turn into uh, Z star U adjoint. And a unitary, a matrix is unitary if U dagger U is the identity. And so this, this uh, dot product, which is what I'm writing here, is invariant under a unitary transformation. Um, a symplectic group is more complicated and um, it's not mentioned very much in physics courses. And it's a pity because in fact, the symplectic group SP2NR is the set of all 2n by 2n real matrices that leave invariant the commutation relations of n coordinates and n momenta and of quantum mechanics. So one would think that it would at some point be rediscovered as important, but it's been left in the dust by physicists so far. And then there are various finite groups, um, the group of all integers. Um, is uh, called Z integers under uh, integers under addition actually because um, the integers don't form a group under multiplication because you don't have an inverse the inverse of an integer is uh, is a fraction not an integer. 
Um, now in physics, we often talk about um, continuous groups. These are groups that, determine, that depend upon continuous set of parameters like the orthogonal groups, the unitary groups, or um, the, the Lorentz group or the Poincaré group, or the group of translations. And, um, but now since all uh, matrix, since matrix multiplication naturally, um, uh, what shall I say that Matrix, well, let me start all over. If you have, a, suppose you have a group and you have some group multiplication law, namely Fg is equal to, F times G is equal to Fg. Then um, you might be able to find a set of square matrices D of G, such that D of F times D of G is equal to D of Fg. If this is the case, then if you can do this for all elements of the of the group, then this is said to be a representation of the group. And uh, this uh, representations of group have been found to play an important role in um, physics, in particular the group SU2 and SO3, which represent rotations. Um, and uh, one, one thing to mention here is that um, you have some groups that are compact, others that are non-compact. Um, qualitatively, a, a compact group is one like the rotations that uh, if, you, if you keep doing the group element, you come back to where you started. I mean, you don't get infinitely far away. Others are non-compact, and those are like the translations or the Lorentz transformations where you can accelerate a particle to arbitrarily high energy, uh, or you can translate a particle, uh, in other words, move a particle arbitrarily an arbitrary distance. So those are non-compact. And one of the things about representations um, by finite dimensional matrices is that um, if the group is compact, then it has a representation in terms of finite dimensional unitary matrices. Of course, the matrices could be real, in which case they're finite dimensional orthogonal matrices. Um, on the other hand, if the group is like the Lorentz group or the Poincaré group that is um, non-compact, then the representations are, uh, the, uh, finite dimensional representations are not compact and um, you need an infinite, in order to have a unitary transformation, you need a, uh, an infinite dimensional representation. Um, now, sometimes you have a rep, oh, well, let, me, let me just mention one important thing that you probably already know, namely that if you have a representation, if you have a, matri a set of matrices, you can define another set of matrices by what's known as a similarity transformation. And a similarity transformation, if the if your matrices D are n by n, then uh, and S is any n by n matrix that has an inverse, and then and you multiply by D by S inverse on the left and S on the right, you get another D, D prime, and this this provide these matrices provide just a good a, just as good a representation as D of G. And so you can you can see that from this equation, d prime of f, d prime of g. Well, it's these things here, and then S S inverse gives you the identity. So you have d of f and d of g. And that's d of f g. But that's d prime of f g. And so this is a, called an equivalent representation. So anytime you have a representation of a group. Um, there are infinitely, you can immediately generate, or you can actually in a time consuming way, probably infinitely amount of time, you can, you can write down uh, an infinite set of equivalent representations. Um, the difference between D prime and D is just this multiplication on the left by S inverse and on the right by S. And so, in other words, d prime of g functions just like d 
D of G, but in the other in the primed representation. So in other words, we have two representations. We have D and then we have D prime. Well, let me put a D prime there. So D prime of G is S inverse S, where S is just any matrix that has such that the inverse is, is defined. And um, so sometimes if you have a representation and you can find a similarity, this is called a similarity transformation, to go from a representation D to another representation D prime in this way, it's said to be a similarity transformation. And it's called a similarity transformation because the two representations are so similar. In fact, they're equivalent. And that's another term. The representations are said to be equivalent. Now, sometimes a representation is equivalent to a representation that's in a sort of block diagonal form. It's the matrices aren't all diagonal, but they're in chunks like that. And then we say the representation is reducible. And so in other words, you, instead of worrying about this big representation, you can analyze this one and analyze that one. And then just know that, um, that the big one is just a bunch of them on a, acting independently because this acts only on the first few components of a vector and this one only acts on the second few components. And so um, these things are acting independently, which is related to this business about a proper subspace. Sub, 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 uh, so let's see, you're asking whether D prime can work. Yeah, I, th I think that that's exactly right. Um, in other words, um, I, I, I think, in fact, you're, you're, you're exactly right to say that. Um, for example, um, actually, there was a G here that I left out. Suppose the G's are a rotation. To take your example. And then S is a fixed rotation. Now, what a fixed rotation does is it sort of changes all the axes, doesn't it? In three space, it turns the axes into, let's see if I can, they might look like that. And um, in fact, if I do them in color, if that one is black, and let's say this is this is the y axis well then this one might also be the y axis and then if um this is the z axis this might be the transformed z axis so s might be a rotation that takes the the ordinary xyz axes into a new set of axes the reds into the greens and, um, well, actually it's uh, black, red, and green into black, red, and green. Anyway, um, that would represent then a change of coordinates. And uh, so you would have uh, D prime of G would be S inverse, which, which would be a change of coordinates, D of G, S, and so, this would say then that um, the set of rotations is represented by a set of ma uh, matrices that are similar to and equivalent to the set of matrices that represent um, the rotations in a different coordinate system. So you're, you're right about that. That's a good way of thinking. Now something, something that um, some of the giants in the field, Wigner and then Weinberg um, point, uh, derived um, 
uh, has to do with symmetry transformations. Um, in, in a quantum theory, a symmetry transformation is a map of states. So psi might go to psi prime, phi go to phi prime, that preserves probabilities. This is the inner product of a state in quantum mechanics, one state psi with another state phi. And um, if you know your system is in state psi, and you ask what's the probability of finding it in the state phi, well, that's the inner product of these two. And um, uh, one has a uh, symmetry if, um, if uh, the transformed states have inner products that uh, whose absolute values are the same as the untransformed in a product. And um, there are various ways of thinking of this, for example, of symmetry under translations in space. Um, these numbers would represent the, in fact, I can make this thing bigger so that it would be easier for both of us to see. This might be the probability of uh, a certain experiment occurring at, um, one point in say Albuquerque, this might be doing the same experiment with the same apparatus or an equivalent apparatus in Boston. And um, typically uh, these results would be the same. Um, of course they differ because of maybe changes in temperature or uh, the magnetic field of the earth and so forth. But, um, but uh, if, the system is invariant under this translation from one city to another, then uh, the probabilities would be the same. Now, what Wigner showed is that this, such a symmetry, the action of a group of symmetry transformations on the space of states can be represented either by unitary operators, and these are linear and unitary, and that's the usual case, or by anti-linear and anti-unitary uh, operators, which is um, the spooky case. Um, and it's, uh, it's what you need in the case of time reversal. Um, so let, let me, let me sk skip this. I encourage you to read it and uh, so forth, but I'm, I'm gonna skip ahead to something that I think is more important. And as I said, you could go to the class webpage. Whoops, I went too far. Class webpage and read that stuff yourself. And if you have a question and you come to class on Thursday, you know, you can shoot me a question or you can send me an email about the question. Let me um, get back to what I think is more important to go on with, um, as I said, we in physics, we are often call, uh, talking about groups that are continuous. Continuous groups are ones who, that are, that depend upon continuous set of, trend, of, of parameters and obviously translations you can translate by in space by any three vector. Uh, or you can do a translation by any four vector. Um, so you change the time as well as the location in space. And, um, and then the, the, the Lorentz transformations, well, it depends, uh, there you've got a rotation and, you, and you've got a boost. Um, and uh, those depend upon six real parameters altogether. Um, so we have um, various um, groups of transformations that depend upon continuous parameters. And um, what, what, what is convenient is to um, write the, so, so in other words, the group element G depends upon a set of parameters alpha and uh, it's more convenient instead of writing D of G of alpha to just write D of alpha. So to go directly from the parameters to the matrix, uh, to the matrix. And uh, one might have two representations 
of course, you always, if you have one, you, want, you have infinitely many representations of the same group, and that would be d prime of alpha would be d prime of g of alpha. And as I said, these are representations, and that means then that if g of alpha times g of beta is g of gamma, then d of alpha times d of beta has to be d of gamma, and d prime of alpha times d prime of beta has to be d prime of gamma. And um, so that's, that's, remember, that's the key thing about a representation. It has to faithfully rep reproduce the multiplication law of the group. Um, now, the study of the groups uh, is made vastly simpler by looking in, by using calculus and instead just looking at the group, uh, groups near the identity um, element, the identity element being just a, uh, just the matrix I, which is um, one, zero, zero. Whoops, that was a zero. Let me, let me switch to black because it's easier to read. And so forth. So it's if it's n by n, you just have ones on the main diagonal, zeros everywhere else. Um, so um, what what we do is we differentiate the the matrix D with respect to a particular parameter, set all the parameters equal to zero, and multiply by minus i, and. The reason here is that if D is unitary, then these matrices, these matrices T, which we call generators, uh, turn out to be Hermitian. And um, let's see, let me just give you an example of that. You um, probably have seen the group SU2 and you've seen the Pauli matrices, sigma one, which is zero, one, one, zero, and sigma two, which is zero minus i, i zero, and sigma three, which is one, zero, zero minus one. Have you seen those in a quantum mechanics class or maybe a group theory class? Hello? So I'm, I'm just wondering, I need, I need to know what you know in order to teach you what you don't know. In any event, these are examples of generators. These are the, these matrices are um, one choice of generators for the group SU2, which represents the rotations of a spin one half object. Um, So let me, um, I guess, go on for a moment here. Uh, the idea here is, you see, that, um, that we're imagining that D of alpha, uh, if, if, if the T's are the derivatives of D of alpha, then D of alpha is going to be approximately one plus I alpha one T one plus I alpha two T two plus dot, 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 however many uh, generators there happen to be. And uh, that's this expression here. And um, what you can then, this is for alpha, for alpha, all the alphas small. Um, 
And you can make the alpha super small by just doing this, taking D of alpha over N. This would then be I plus a sum on all the particular generators. Well, I'm using N by t for two diff damn different things here. Um, let me make, let me change this a little bit. And I'm going to call this uh, capital N. So we're going to sum over the generators, however many, many there might be. And this is I alpha sub A uh, T, what did I use? T sub A. But now the alphas are over capital N. And um, so then D of alpha is this thing raised to the nth power. And that's just e to the i, the sum alpha a t a. And so that's, this is called the exponential representation. And um, if the T's are Hermitian, then the adjoint of D of alpha is E to the minus I sum alpha A T A adjoint. And if the T A, if the, if, if the TAs are Hermitian, then this is E to the minus I sum alpha A TA, and that's equal to D inverse of alpha. So, and you go from there to there, if TA equals TA dagger. So TA, uh, the T, the generators being Hermitian is equivalent to D adjoint equal to D inverse. Okay, so um, so now we get to one of the really interesting things about continuous groups and Lie algebra, uh, namely um, we can think about um, a funny sort of multiplication of group elements near the identity. And so let's think about something like G of minus alpha, which is the inverse of G of alpha, at least if alpha is very close to the identity. G of minus beta G of alpha, G of beta. So this is, at least for small alpha beta, this is going to be um, something near the identity. And according, depending on what the group is, we can call it G of gamma of alpha and beta. So this is just, this is just the multiplication law of the group. But then if we have two representations of the group, and these could be representations by matrices of different dimensions, then we would, then if these, if, if the D's are a representation, then it must be true that D of beta, D of alpha, D of minus beta, D of minus alpha is D of gamma of alpha and beta. 
gamma being the set of parameters that depend upon that occur when you do this multiplication. But d prime is also a representation. So we have to have d primes go like this. And now what we can do is say, all right, suppose that um, D of alpha is just E to the I epsilon T sub alpha, just a particular generator, not all the generators, but just a particular one and D of beta is E to the I epsilon T sub beta, just a particular generator. Then if you multiply this out, and I think I'll just display it here on the screen, multiplying this exponential, epsilon being a small number, we're just gonna keep terms up to epsilon squared. And so the TB term gives us this, the T, um, well, I switched from, I should have called this A and, and I should have called this B. So I'm sw switching back to Roman indices here. Then G, uh, uh, D of, um, D of uh, A or alpha sub A then gives us this expression. E to the I epsilon TA gives us that. And then the inverses give us these expressions. So the quadratic terms turn out to be the same, but the linear terms make a difference. And if you multiply these out and keep only quadratic terms, which is all we're entitled to keep because we only kept quadratic terms here. The linear terms cancel, but there's a quadratic term. The quadratic term is the commutator. And the other representation gives the same result, just has a lot of primes. So it's also, it's equal to this. But then that means that D of gamma is one plus epsilon squared times one commutator. D prime of gamma is one plus epsilon squared times the other commutator. And this uh, matrix D of gamma is, um, has the same set of parameters. So in other words, it's, you have a set of generators here, the generators for the D representation and the generators for the D prime representation, but you have the same parameters here, the same multiplicative constants. And these are called the structure constants. And so what we see is they have to be the same for all representations. And so what we have then is that um, TA, TB is the commutator of TA with TB, TB is I, a sum on C of F, C, A, B, T, C, and the commutator of T prime A with T prime B is um, I, a sum of the same structure constants times the generators for the other representation. And so what we find here then is that if we have two representations which could have different dimensions, then um, their co the commutators are the same apart from primes. So the commutator of any two generators is first of all a linear combination of the generators and secondly the coefficients are the structure constants of the group and thirdly they're the same the structure constants are the same for all representations of the group the the uh, generators differ 
but the structure constants are the same. Um, so let's see, I've gone through a lot of material here and it would be good for the student and it would guide me if the student would ask a question um, or make a statement. Um, let me um, maybe just illustrate this a little bit. What we have, remember I mentioned the Pauling matrices, sigma one is zero one zero zero one one zero. Sigma two is zero minus i i zero, and sigma three is one zero zero minus one. So these are the Pauling matrices, and now you can say, well, what is sigma one sigma two? Well, this is uh, zero one one zero times zero minus i, i zero. And so this is i zero, uh, zero minus i. And now we see what I've been saying, namely this is equal to i times sigma three. And if we work out the rest of the commutators, for example, sigma two with sigma three, this would be zero minus i, i zero, one zero zero minus one. Oh, ha, sorry, I, I did something really stupid. I forgot to do them in the other order. So if we do them in the other order, so this, this was terrible. I got carried away here with this multiplication. Uh, we we want to, so let me just draw something here. So we want to subtract this. And so this would be this minus, and what is this product? It would be uh, minus i, uh, zero, zero, i. And so now subtracting this from that, what we get is two i, sigma three. And actually, now that I remember, the um, the convention is not that the uh, generators are the Pauli matrices, but rather the generators are the Pauli matrices divided by two. And so uh, we need to divide by two. But let's let's do that at the end. So here. What we have is this minus one zero zero minus one zero minus i i zero, and we so let's do that multiplication. This top one is zero i um, i zero, and we're subtracting from here uh, zero minus i minus i zero. And if we, so what we get then is two i zero one one zero. Okay, so that's two i sigma one. So we see the commutators um, are linear combat. The commutator of so far any two generators is a linear combination of the generators. In this case, it's um, quite simple. Namely, that sigma one, sigma two, or sigma. In, in other words, the way this the way this works is this: the actual generators are sigma one over two, sigma two over two, and if we divide through in this way, we see this is i sigma three over two. The next one would be sigma two over two, sigma three over two, is i. Uh, sigma one over two. And then we would also have sigma three over two, sigma one over two is I sigma two over two. And we can, if we talk about um, this thing called epsilon 
i j k which is one if i j k are one two three or an even permutation of one two three minus one if it's two one three or an even permutation of two one three or zero if any two are the same then we can write the commutation relations of su2 whoops commutation relations of su2 are sigma a over 2 sigma b over 2 is i epsilon abc sigma c over 2 and this is summed c equal to 1 to 3 and so you can see this repeats this because the first line corresponds to epsilon 1 2 3 equal to 1 and then if we do an even permutation of this we get epsilon 2 1 3 no 2 3 1 Two three one, so this is two three one, and then finally epsilon three one two, that's this one, is equal to one, and so these numbers substituted into here give you these three rules. This is the algebra of then of uh, SU two, and um, any representation of SU2 will have generators such that TATV will be I epsilon ABC TC. In the case of the two by two defining, okay, here's a question, sorry. Great question. Great question. The structure constants here are just this. They're equal to the, the structure constants are epsilon ABC and they're equal to plus or minus one or zero for SU2. But for some other group, they can be different. And what you expect, you see, is that if you take the commutator of two generators, you get a linear combination of the generators, you factor out an I and what's left are the structure constants. So the structure constants are what's left and the structure constants are what's true for every representation of the group. So they're properties of the group, not properties of the representation. That's what's interesting about them. And, and that's why Lie algebras are simple compared, whereas groups are complicated. Lie algebras are relatively simple. And so the, the generators for SU2 are sigma A over two for the two by two representation of SU2, but there are infinitely many representations of SU2 and they all have to satisfy this um, this relation where the epsilons are plus or minus one. So in other words, epsilon one, two, three is one, but that's all, that's also equal to epsilon two, three, one, epsilon three, one, two. On the other hand, epsilon two, one, three, this is an odd permutation of one, two, three. So this is minus one, and this is equal to epsilon uh, one, three, two, which is equal to epsilon three, two, one. And um, so these are all the non-zero, there are six non-zero epsilons, and then all the others are zero. In other words, epsilon one, one, two, is zero epsilon 
one two two zero epsilon three 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 is zero any with a repeating index is zero and the reason is that these epsilons the epsilons are totally totally anti-symmetric Now, the anti-symmetry, they're also real and anti-symmetric. The fact that they're real and anti-symmetric is um, true for all compact groups. But for non-compact groups, they need not be real and anti-symmetric. I think what I'll do is I'll put these notes on the class uh, web page. And this video of today's class is going to go on YouTube. And the first two classes are also on YouTube. Um, YouTube is, as you know, very easy to use because um, uh, well, because the people at Google know what they're doing and <laughs> they don't, they do things very well. In fact, I think Google has contributed more to humanity than, all, than any other corporation. Um, they have made information more accessible um, than any other organization. And the accessibility of information is really important. All right, let's let's go on just a little bit. Um, these generators. Also, let me switch to a different color. Oh, I've, I'm in blue already. Let me switch to red. Um, these generators, you can. These generators are matrices, and so you can multiply three times T A plus four times T B, and you get something else. The point is that since they can be added together and multiplied by numbers, the TAs are matrices. In the case of the defining representation of SU2, they're two by two matrices, but they're also vectors. Because a vector is just something that can be, you can add vectors and multiply them by numbers. And there's a, there are various ways of making vectors orthogonal. And um, one of the ways to do that is the Gram-Schmidt procedure. That's in section 110 of the book. Um, and by the way, that chapter 110, the PDF of that, cha that chapter is on the website for 466, which um, you can get to through the physics uh, department website. You just have to click in the right place. Um, and so what you can do is you can define an inner product of any two generators for any group. And you'd call it the trace of the adjoint of one generator times the other generator. Remember the trace of a matrix the matrix A is the sum of the diagonal elements of A. And if these are n by n matrices, then it's a sum like that. So that's the, it's the sum of the diagonal matrices. It's of the diagonal elements. So it's A11, A22, dot, dot, dot. You add it up to A, N, N. So you take the one generator, the adjoint to the other, product, sum the diagonal elements, that's a trace, and that's the inner product then. Remember that um, if you have, if you're taking the adjoint of some matrix, suppose you have a matrix A, B, C, D. So, um, and you want to take the adjoint of that, then that is A complex conjugate 
B complex conjugate, C complex conjugate, D complex conjugate. So you complex conjugate every mate, every element, and you take the transpose. So adjoint complex conjugate transpose. Mathematicians have a nicer notation for um, transposition. They just use a prime. But in physics, we use prime to mean different. And so, as I did, for example, in this equation and this equation. Now, one of the things that people um, like to do, and it started, I don't know if it started with Einstein, but he was the most famous person to do it. Well, most famous person to do it for sure, but um, I don't know who he was the first, and it was to, the, the, a summation convention, namely if you repeat an index, like here C is repeated, what you really mean is that you're summing over C and from context, you infer what the sum is. So here, you're summing over um, all uh, the generators, however many there happen to be. In the case of SU2, there are three. In the case of other groups, there are others, uh, other numbers of generators. Um, in the case of SU3, it turns out there are eight. In the case of U3, there are nine. Anyway, um, these uh, structure constant relations, if you omit the sum, then it looks like this, where this is just, uh, the sum is implied. So in other words, you're supposed to interpret these two equations to actually mean that. But it, it turns out that if you don't have these extra symbols on the page, it, it's just, less confusing. It might be more confusing at first, but it's less confusing later. And um, once you've made these generators orthogonal, um, you can do various things and find out various things. The first thing you can find out is um, that if you multiply the commutator by the adjoint of some generator, well, the commutator gives you I sum on C, FCAB trace TC, TD dagger. Um, so what is that? Well, remember that a trace, the trace of AB is going to be the sum A, I, J, B, J, I, it's going to be sum on I and J of those two, but that's the same thing as the sum B, J, I, A, I, J, and that's the trace of B times A. So we say that the trace is cyclic. And the reason we say cyclic rather than abelian is that, that we have this, for example, trace of ABC is trace of CAB. That's a big C, so let me just. And that's equal to trace of BCA. So just using this formula, the trace of AB is trace of BA, um, and uh, putting in some imaginary parentheses like this. I don't know why the, all right, so let me go back to dark again, blue. And um, to go from there to there, well, let, let me switch to green. We can imagine parentheses like this. And then using the 
fact that trace of AB is trace of BA, you get all these relations. In any event, that means that we can, um, going back to here, we've got trace of C times trace of D dagger of T, I'm sorry, trace of TC times TD dagger. But then these two guys, that's the same thing as a trace of TD dagger times TC, but that has to be delta CD, which is, let me just make sure you know what delta is. Delta AB is one if A is equal to B, zero if A is not equal to B. And um, so um, that was the, that's what I meant by orthogonality here. And um, so now we get to delta CD. And so that means we're summing over C, but the only time we get not something that's not zero is when C is equal to D. So we get a D here. So now we have this formula that FDAB is one over IK times that. And so changing, turning D into C, we see FCAB is minus I over K, the trace of the commutator of A with B times TC dagger. So that's a formula for the structure constant. So in other words, if you have the um, matrices of your representation, you have the formula for the generators, you just take the commutator, take the adjoint of another generator, and that gives you the structure constants. And on the other hand, what you can see here is that, um, is that um, TA, T, the commutator of TA with TB, of course, is TA TB minus TB TA, whereas the commutator of TB TA is TB TA minus TA TB. And so these two things are in our opposites. In other words, they differ by a minus sign. Ugh. All right, hold on, let me just. So since the commutator is anti-symmetric with respect to order, if we change, interchange A and B, we get a minus sign here. And so that means that FCAB is minus FCBA. And this is true for the structure constants of any Lie group. These are all, these continuous groups are called Lie groups, by the way, in honor of Sophus Lee, who first introduced such things. He actually invented Lie algebra in order to study Lie groups. And um, most of us have said, well, good luck to you studying Lie groups. We'll just stick with the Lie algebra. Um, which is so much simpler. Now, if you take any n by n matrix, you can write, you can make a Hermitian matrix out of it. You just take A plus A dagger. Hermitian, this thing is Hermitian because A plus A dagger dagger is A dagger plus A, A, which is of course the same thing as A plus A dagger. And um, the reason why a, a dagger dagger is A is that A dagger dagger is a complex transpose, complex transpose. So the complex conjugates cancel and you transpose twice, you just get A again. So, um, you can make a Hermitian matrix and an anti-Hermitian matrix. A minus A dagger, dagger is minus A minus A dagger. Um, and so you can take the generators of a um, group 
and uh, divide them into Hermitian generators and anti-Hermitian generators. And the Hermitian ones give you a give you a unitary matrix. The anti-Hermitian ones give you a non-unitary matrix. And um, what turns out to be the case here is that if the generators are Hermitian, then you can replace T dagger, TC dagger by TC. And then when you follow all these, you use the cyclicity of the trace, you can find out that FBAC is the same thing as FCBA, which is the same thing as minus FCAB. And you get some more relations. The result is that the structure constants of a compact Lie group are totally anti-symmetric. So remember, we saw that the structure constants for um, SU2 were just epsilon ABC. And um, uh, let's see, that was, that's what we would have called FC AB. Let me get my notation exactly straight here. Right, A, B, A, B, right, okay. Right. Um, and as I said, these things were, I said these guys were totally anti-symmetric. It's an anti, anti-symmetric. And that's because SU2 is a compact group. On the other hand, um, uh, non-compact groups aren't necessarily totally anti-symmetric. And so what you do, since this thing is totally anti-symmetric, you often drop the upper index and just move it over there and call that um, FABC. So what we often do is just write it this way. Um, that's for a compact group. Um, and it's only for SU2 that it, uh, FABC is epsilon ABC. Um, so this is the way one, uh, this is the total anti-symmetry uh, relation and uh, the notation that people usually use for a compact group um, and the anti-symmetry relations look like this. On the, and moreover, you can also show that the co uh, structure constants are real uh, if the group is um, uh, compact, because again, the generators are Hermitian. And so you can show that F star ABC is F ABC. So if the, if the group is compact, then the commutator of any, well, the commutator of any two generators of a Lie group is a linear combination of the generators. And the structure constants are real and totally anti-symmetric if the group is compact. So I think we're basically, the class is basically over. Let's see. Okay, so to answer that question, what you have is if, if the group is compact, then F A B C is equal to minus F, let us see, what did you do? F right, A C B, yes, that's right. Um, and one example of that is epsilon A B C is minus epsilon A C B. All right, well, um, so I, um, so thanks for coming to class. Um, as I say, I'll put the class on the, on YouTube and the, and this um, note, uh, this uh, scribbling that I've done, I'll put that on the class webpage. Um, uh, I'll, be presumably holding class on Thursday. Um, but the, at some point, this class is liable to be canceled because um, so far nobody has actually registered um, 
for it. I mean, unless you did this afternoon or unless somebody did this afternoon and I don't know about it. Um, and so the class is liable to be canceled. I will, however, be, well, I am offering also problems classes and um, um, research classes. And so you could sign up for one of them and um, we could continue uh, discussions like this. Um, uh, on the other hand, those classes could get canceled unless um, you can find friends to register along with you. Um, so um, the university doesn't like to have classes that have no students or only one student. Um, they like two or three, they prefer five or six, and they really like 10 or 20. Um, anyway, um, stay safe and Well, I'm, I'd urge you to enroll for, enroll for 467 and see if you can get some friends to enroll. Um, it's, it's a very easygoing class in which I would like the students to set the pace, especially if they're undergraduates. Um, but even if they're graduate students, there's no point in me rambling on at, at the speed of thought. Um, just because I've thought about these things for a long time, um, we should be proceeding at the speed of, that's convenient for the students. And, um, and um, the way to do that is to continue to ask questions as you have uh, today. Um, so um, I'll be sending out um, an invitation to uh, register to for the problems causes that I mentioned. Um, but um, you're certainly welcome, you're more than welcome to register for 467. And um, uh, the chairman of my department and I would be delighted if you could find some friends who would like to take the course. And there are also many other things we can talk about in this course, um, artificial intelligence, path integrals, um, general relativity. The basic ideas of all of these subjects are understandable and um, um, the key to understanding them when I'm teaching is for students to ask questions so that I don't run ahead of the students by mistake. All right, well, in any event, um, stay out of bars and stay healthy. Um, uh, you're not going to be signing up for class if you've got COVID-19. So um, good luck and um, maybe we'll um, talk again on um, Thursday or some other day. So bye, I'm going to stop the class now. <laughs>